Um, our next speaker is Adriana Marques from the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park. Um, please, Adriana, I think I have. Okay, so I'm from Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park over in Stratford. Shall I do a little dance with you? And in kind of in line with the title for this section, I think one of the things I'm mainly going to be talking about is the, I guess, the definition or, or the tensions between this publicly public, private, the owned, the not owned, the controlled, the not controlled. Um, I've been working on the Olympic Park for the last four years and it's really just kind of like thrown up a lot of these really interesting kind of tensions um, that I'm going to talk through with you this morning. Uh, but before I go on, I think one of the things that's really started to become quite interesting for me and which I kind of wrestle with on a daily basis is where does kind of mass participation meet artistic exploration? And is that even kind of a question worth answering or, or, or asking? Um, my role in the Olympic Park, I should clarify, I'm head of arts and culture, so my role is both to program the park uh, with what I have long discussions with my colleagues about is, you know, what is culture, what is artistic? Uh, but I also have a wider role to kind of support the creative industries and the local cultural organisations in East London and to just kind of like knit that together as, as to one area and to, to make sure that the Olympic Park is seen as just one small section um, of a wider whole. So, ooh, quite loud. Um, what's quite interesting about the Olympic Park as it is now, Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park, we are a publicly funded organisation. We are funded by the, the Mayor of London. Um, that means that we have regeneration objectives. We are here to kind of create benefits. We need to create jobs. We need to build houses. Uh, we need to bring money back in to the taxpayer because we need to pay back the money that we spent on the Olympics. So there's lots of pressures from us on that aspect. Um, we're also a planning authority, so the red line that you see here means that any development, any building that happens within that comes to us for approval. Um, but what's really interesting is that we are both a public space, but it's just a very, very highly controlled one. And we also need to deal with just a myriad of different uh, landowners um, and, and different kind of authorities. So, you know, a lot of kind of the similarities that John was, was just talking through. Um, the main two areas in blue that I've pointed out are, are effectively what we are promoting as, you know, the open park. It's still an open park. It's open 24-7. It's free, which is, is still quite amazing to us that people think that we are that this is a, a commercial space that you need to pay to go into. You need to pay for coffee, but you know it, it, it's still a free park as any other kind of local authority managed park in London is. Um, but then we also have to deal with you know the other kind of private entity so Westfield obviously huge commercial you know uh, kind of beast on our doorstep god forbid that we should ever disrupt any Saturday traffic going into the car park so you know that means that we have to plan our events very carefully around them um, here east is a new development uh, that has a number of different partners in there the international quarter is owned by Lendlease. Uh, we also work with you know all of the different transport companies TfL um, and then also you've then got the borough boundaries on there. So the land still belongs to the boroughs, but we manage it for them. And on a daily basis, I kind of like die through health and safety processes. So if anybody else is kind of strangled through health and safety, then I would be very interested in either sharing our pain or, or getting some advice. Um, so this is one of my favorite uh, slides. Spot the graffiti if you can. I don't know. I can't say it out loud. Um, but maybe people in the front row can kind of Chinese whispers it backwards. Um, but this was probably from around 2005, 2006. It was after the bid had just been uh, won. This is one of, I'm going to do an after image in a moment. But I think it's just understanding that, that it is a very sensitive development of a publicly owned um, piece of land. You know, this was once known as the wilderness. It was beautiful. It was overgrown. It was derelict. It was unregulated. It was solemn. It was... I mean, I, I have places in my heart for both what it was then and, and what it is now, which is this. So the graffiti has gone, the colour has remained, um, and it is this new, very beautiful park, which can also be, you know, provide solitude in the middle of a city if you go at eight o'clock on a Monday morning. Um, but it is also very branded, very controlled. Um, and because of the Olympic context and the amount of public money that we spent, it's again about promoting that we have to provide a public benefit back to you guys. 
Um, this was one of the, I guess, the most kind of influential projects in terms of the work that I do now um, that was, you know, a guerrilla project done by the Office of Subversive Architecture, probably in, again, like 2007. Um, obviously, the blue hoarding that went up around the Olympic Park as it was being um, built was very controversial because it instantly became this very, very visual marker of, okay, this was once public and was yours and now it's not. Um, and just this really simple, you know, it's the human curiosity what the hell are you doing behind that fence on our land? Five minutes, okay, gosh, very quickly. So this, so we took the, for, the, the request, if you like, for a formal viewing platform to this, which is the ViewTube, built again on public land, actually developed by Urban Space Management, who run Trinity Boy Wharf um, here, and that's turned into a community facility. Um, I've been working on commissioning a series of permanent artworks in the park, you know, really small things and simple things like these plaques um, with these kind of fantastic facts on there uh, suggested by local communities, right through to big, you know, statement artworks that people don't even really see as artworks, which I think is also quite interesting. Um, through to kind of like trying to give the park back to the local community. So I recently just commissioned this project, which is about local artists designing adverts for local organizations, um, you know, local businesses, which is again about trying to kind of balance our big brand with, you know, the, the real grit and character of East London. Um, this is just kind of a myriad of, of all of the different projects that we've delivered in the last two years since the, the park has been reopened again. This was quite a controversial piece that we commissioned last summer where experimental artists Bompus and Parr effectively dyed the liver... Liver, river Lee, sorry, uh, River Lee Green, and I mean, obviously, connotations with uh, pollution and, and environmental issues and all of that. But I just always maintain that we are not a park for fireworks. You know, we're, we're not. We are there to try the new and to push the boundaries. And I guess where I come from is is in terms of forwarding artistic experimentation. Um, apart from this very last slide, which is when we did do fireworks, but this is um, the Squibbers, which is a 400-year-old uh, carnival tradition that originates from Bridgewater. And this was my one health and safety triumph um, in the summer, which really was like, okay, we've done it. Can we do it again? Um, and yes, culture remains at the heart of East London, and I think that, that's effectively what we're here for. Thank you. Thank you, Adriana.